tell me the story behind it, which really outlines why construction and inspection um, is so important. Um, and, and, you know, I showed the slide a whole bunch of times, but I never understood why there was this bench on both sides of the, uh, was it an infiltration trench? Yeah. Okay. And he explained it was because that was what it was supposed to be built excavated to grade? Yeah, that was supposed to be the original grade. That on the plan set was the original grade for the site. And then this is how deep the contractor dug. So you went about three or four feet further down? No, no, the, the grading excavator was supposed to grade down to that lower elevation. That's what it was designed to. And the grading contractor obviously didn't check his grades and, and that extra three feet of soil was, it was supposed to be graded lower. So when the contractor that designed to build this showed up, all their elevations were off. If they were to build it to the exact elevation, so that's what they're doing here is trying to figure out what, what to do. <laughs> so this is the classic case of what's designed in the office versus what's constructed in the field. And the purpose of construction inspection is to make sure that the two uh, align properly. Sometimes you have to make field changes because of something that was unanticipated during the construction phase or the soils or geotech work. Um, but we also want to make it as good as the plan as possible. So um, this is my colleague Dave Hirschman from the Center for Watershed Protection. And the purpose is to avoid failure. Uh, here's a case of that filter fabric issue and lo and behold. It has failed, which is not good. And we're not just confirming elevations and volumes and depths and slopes, but we're trying to confirm that the bio is established. So that's a, probably the biggest difference from traditional pond inspection is I'm going out to say, have they met a certain percent vegetative cover or plant survival, um, is the water actually getting in? <clears throat> and so in a few minutes, Cecilia will take over and go through all the visual indicators, uh, which go from, um, from the entire suite. But I'm just going to focus on um, construction inspection through to project inspection acceptance. Basically, construction inspection is done multiple times during the construction, and then there's a final punch list to make sure that as a community or a village or a city, that I'm going to accept the practice. And so the purpose of that is to make sure the project is built for design, and any field changes are acceptable to the engineer. Uh, the tool, we use some kind of a checklist and then the frequency depends on the size of the project. And unlike some other situations, you usually want the engineer to, to certify that it, uh, it, it was done right. And so they, they'll often perform the construction inspection and submit that data to the MS4 uh, or the local review authority. Um, the things that we've been talking about earlier this morning, um, about what we really look for, we want to verify that the actual contributing drainage area, the boundaries are as designed. This is a pretty common problem um, because as we talked about, Navy contractors have difficulty in getting that, that right. In the outlet elevations, I told you that sweet spot of the three inches versus the flat and six. Side slope stabilization. And um, we usually like on the larger facilities to confirm that the plumbing works. So some full inundation uh, test uh, is often helpful to make sure uh, we get a water truck out. Uh, alternatively, you can wait for the first couple of storms and see what happens. First couple of seats up here. Um, 
and that's there to make sure that we've got our final grades and there's no sinking in the facility. Some of the other critical points, uh, construction inspection, we want to make sure that the media is right. As I showed earlier, bad media is uh, a pretty common problem. And where it comes from or how it's mixed. The other issue is stone. Um, the specs will say double wash stone, and a lot of contractors won't do that step. So you want to make sure when the materials come on site that you don't have a lot of rock flour. That rock flour can cause grading uh, compaction. Um, and then, you know, it's kind of funny with under drains and drop inlets and all that kind of stuff, uh, making sure that they're joined properly at the right elevation. And I've seen, maybe you seen it too, folks who are putting in six inch under drains but without perforation. People putting in the under drains with perforations but with both ends uncapped. So that's the way to go. And it seems kind of silly but uh, it happens because maybe the um, crew supervisor called it sick that day and somebody's just making decisions and so forth. So the role of construction inspection is to make sure that it's done right. And in terms of final ponding depth, let's say this ponding is 12 inches. We want to confirm that. And, uh, this is an area where in the real world um, there was a study done in North Carolina where they did LIDAR of I think 35 by retention found that only 30% uh, were achieving the desired treatment volume that was in the design. The rest were either deeper or shallower in the design. Most were shallower and there were some reasons for it. So those things um, should be easy to do. So I'm going to kick off, um, before we get into a lot of the details, what is the typical construction construction sequence in a monotonous step-by-step -step way. But I think your contractors are the weakest link right now. Um, and getting them to fully understand the one, two, three approach is uh, important. So first thing uh, is it we have Mr. Utility in Maryland. What would you have for your PA1 call. PA1 call. So you, you mark the utilities, you stake out the dimensions. In this case, they put in some sill fence to protect the bioretention areas during construction. And again, uh, we've talked about some of these issues. We've seen some of these slides, but you don't start the installation until the site is built out and stabilized. You try to keep construction equipment out of the bioretention areas. So during construction, um, because you're relying on that area, uh, original soil properties, you want to have silt fence around them so construction equipment stays off of them. And here's just an example of uh, two sites that have been really marauded uh, by intense storms. Uh, they had some, see what happened to their silt fence. Very steep sided bioretention area. Uh, so that's why, even though it seems like overkill, having good erosion sediment control is good. I showed the slide before. Uh, the next step is to make sure the original design works and the subtle grading, uh, paving, and drainage can screw up the design. Um, and I'd like to show this photo. Um, only because here's the bioretention area, but it's receiving runoff from four different small areas. And we want to confirm uh, that the out elevations are correct, the water can be in and out, and the drainage area boundaries are working. So that's something. Um, and then, in terms of we want to keep the construction equipment uh, from compacting the soil, so where we can, we construct or we excavate from the side. Um, 
You want to keep the bottom in good shape so you can hear, see the scoop here where we're digging out. You can see the, uh, the spray paint to confirm the, the bed area. If you have a larger cell, you can, uh, uh, you have, you can't completely work outside of it because there's a limit to the arm's reach. Uh, but if you use a cell construction approach where you break it into like a thousand square feet, excavate from the side, have an earth bridge to the next one, excavate to the side. So there's only, you know, a small proportion of the total area that's receiving the weight from the heavy equipment. So you excavate to the correct elevation, and that's, um, I think the, the difference in the past is we used to have the inspector have to go out multiple times. Um, but this is a critical point. So what um, a lot of people are doing now is to take digital photographs and send them in to the uh, local stormwater authority uh, to verify, you know, even if the inspector can't get out there. And so you want to make sure you get it to the right elevation, uh, that the bottom is level, so there's no preferential flow. And then you want to rip the soils a bit to maintain their porosity or increase their porosity from what it was. Um, <clears throat> so now you have, have essentially a, a trench of some kind, and then uh, you're installing the underdrain. Underdrain and overflow should be pretty simple, but this is the second area of common mistakes. So you want to make sure water can move through the system if there is some on the grade. And a lot of people like to lay the material down completely flat, but if it's completely flat, it's very hard to move water. So you need a, a small amount of grade to, to make it work. So you want that positive slope and you want to make sure all the seals and pipe junctions are uh, watertight. It's another common problem. So we talked uh, about filter fabric on the sides only, as opposed to the bottom. And uh, kind of interesting construction detail where uh, they're dropping uh, the stone layer into the bottom. We've got the uh, filter fabric on the sides. Uh, and we'll put the plywood down so that uh, we don't have to put the equipment uh, rolling it by hand. So then uh, laying down the stone layers and the underdrain, again, clean wash stone is something you really want to look at very carefully, make sure it's there. Uh, the choker layer of pea gravel to separate the filter layer, it's important to get that elevation right and that thickness right. Uh, providing a half percent uh, slope uh, to get positive drainage. Uh, basically, to make sure the ends are capped. And then um, showing vertical clean out pipes. And I often laugh because I've never seen a soul who's ever used the clean out pipes for, to clean it up. I don't think I've ever worked when they, when they've tried. So. I'm not sure what the purpose of these clean out pipes are, but you'll see them on a lot of designs. I think there are ways to PVC. Um, the media, you know, so you're essentially you're just building it up. Um, in this case, one foot lifts, lifts pre-mixed. Um, in terms of construction estimation, I think you should allow for 10% settlement. I know that's a little bit generous, but 5% is pretty common. We're raking it out to the final ponding depth a few days later. And then laying down the surface cover, um, the, uh, we, we indicate it could be mulch, turf, or river stone, making sure that it's the right uh, layer. And this is where, again, 
typical contractors may go out and get a bunch of mulch, and if they have a lot of mulch, they'll keep on adding it until they're done. If they didn't buy enough, they'll try to get away with like a quarter inch. So you're going to have two inches of mulch is a key part of this spec. Adding more mulch is not good, less mulch is not either. And bring the ruler out to the site to show that you've got the ponding depth of 9 to 12 inches, um, straw and seeding on the side slopes, uh, or in some cases the erosion control fabric, um, the biodegradable mat on the steeper slopes, and then initial watering of slopes and planting mulch. So again, a number of vegetation fails occur because uh, that critical period when you have the plant material to when you get a big rainstorm uh, or a series of rainstorms, uh, you need to do some uh, watering because your, uh, your media is pretty sandy, so it doesn't hold water as much as you would think. Um, establish the final elevations, dig your planting holes to match the plants to the plan, three foot deep holes for trees. And again, you want to keep the tree planting holes at some distance from the undergrades. Um, what specific distance is just a matter of professional judgment. I would say at least five feet away from the undergrades prevent the tree roots from, um, and you think about it, it's this kind of sandy medium and you're going to try to, the roots are trying to go through your perforations to get out the water that's stuck in the honey. Then you stake the planting location so that people know what to plant. Because again, you know, the planting zones of the, the facultative woodland <coughs> plants versus the upland plants, I think it matters. The, uh, Key elements there are post nursery care, the week or so between when it comes from the nursery, when it's been cared for every day, to maybe when your construction crews can, can plant it. The desiccation and exposure that occurs during that period is usually the biggest source of plant mortality. So, making sure when you bought those expensive little buggers that you're you know, watering them and keeping them moist is good. Uh, for trees, uh, some people recommend staking them because if you have a sandy media, there is a tendency to uh, for them to roll over in, in the ratio or something like that. Um, I'm not as big of a tree staker myself, but some people do it. In some cases, a little bit of spot fertilization might be needed to get them started, but that's going to be like within a specific planting hole for a specific shrub or tree rather than a broadcast and a fertilizer across. Um, so um, this is repeating a little bit of how it does for that um, quality of the filter media, the invert elevations, <coughs> the elevations at the curb cuts and inlets, uh, under drain pipe material, the final ponding depth, and side slope grading are things to look at. And the nice thing about biotension is once you kind of understand and done, run three or four projects through and the field folks have as well, it's pretty easy to see when it's done right and when it's not done right. Uh, but what's going on now for us as a profession is we have a lot of first timers. We have a lot of folks who are bidding on stormwater work landscape contractors and others who are learning their skills. So part of the construction inspection is to make sure that they do it right. The last point I'll make is uh, about the landscape establishment phase, which is very unique to buy retention. Like when I do a stormwater detention pond, I am done. I mean, once I get my hands done, I am done. But with bioretention, we have this landscape establishment phase that may take a while. And so I want to finish the excavation, I'll put my mulch, but I don't want to 
I want to wait at least a growing season to see whether the plants are going to make it. I'd love to have some uh, good set of bid documents. I want to have a carrying replacement warranty so that some percentage of the material can be replaced if it happens not to make it. And as we've kind of indicated, if we don't get our design right, we have a high fail rate on the vegetation. And so it's part of that. Uh, it's an incentive. But it's also, we're not used to hanging for nine months with all this stuff. We used to release my bond, let me go. So it's important to make sure that the contractor understands that they have to do a little watering. Uh, some spot reseeding, repairing problems, replacing dead plants during that six to nine month establishment phase. Essentially getting it through its first winter to the next spring. So that's kind of an unusual uh, thing. And there's often resistance on the part of uh, the builder. And then you do the final inspection uh, using the range of visual indicators that Cecilia uh, will do. And I won't steal her thunder on, on that one, but this is where we accept the facility. I'll just conclude by talking a little bit about as -builds. and uh, We use as for ponds and other large stormwater infrastructure. The question is, do we have to replicate all that survey work on the bioretention? And my answer to that has pretty much been no unless it's a big biotension facility. It's like two acres or so, then maybe uh, a standard as built would make sense, but survey crews cost a fortune you know, to shoot all that stuff. And the biotension, where they shoot it? You know, a little depression. You know, and everything important is underground. You can't see it. So, you know, the surveying and all this fancy stuff is just a waste of time and money. So uh, what we recommend is a series of digital photos, GPS coordinates, uh, uh, certification that it is stable and has met a certain vegetative cover, confirming the ponding elevation and flow paths, and leaving it like that. And the digital photos are very, very important as well as the planting plan, because in five years, people will want to know what was it supposed to look like when it started. Uh, now it's a bushy thing, and they don't know what it is. Uh, for the larger ones, we still we, we don't want to have a, a full-blown pond as built, but maybe some limited survey work to <coughs> confirm inlet and outlet elevations. Uh, a little bit more on the landscaping, meeting the design objectives, verify any stormwater easements, uh, get that into the record, check the overflow, and again, digital photos of when it looked its best. And then, um, you know, you're accepted, and we won't talk about it a lot today, but going forward, uh, as a community, you're going to have a, have a tracking system to record all your BMPs that have ever been put in and that you've been maintaining them faithfully over the years. So you're going to need to put it into some kind of database system to keep those records uh, for future inspections. Um, and in conclusion, I think it, uh, we're still learning all the was important elements of construction inspection, but when it's done right, it, it's essentially just a quality control phase. And if we do good quality control, we get quality products like this uh, that uh, achieve their design intention for how we manage hydrology. We get the pollutant removal, but they also look nice. So with that, I think, are there any questions on the construction inspection? The construction sequence. All right. Well, with that, um, so do you need an introduction? No.
Stormwater coordinator at the Chesapeake Stormwater Network. Um, I don't think Tom did CSN any justice with his uh, uh, you know, invitation to join our network. Um, we have about 7,500 stormwater professionals in the network. Like I said, I send emails about twice a month. It's free to join, and we just email you to let you know about new technical resources um, regarding stormwater and then webcasts. And all of our stuff is grant funded, so it's available for you to download for free. So I recommend that you join because it's good for you. But if it's if you're overwhelmed by email like I am, I understand why you might not want to join. Um, a couple of you I recognize from the last training we did, and I think it was April. So you saw this presentation already, and I apologize for that. But, um, Hopefully, we'll make it a little bit more exciting. I think because Tom covered a lot of the design elements, we can make this more interactive. So I'm going to talk about um, a visual approach to inspecting and maintaining BMPs. And it's a little different than the traditional long checklist when you're doing a wet pond inspection. Um, the idea, or at least what we have heard over and over, is that, okay, we're going from these large practices that treat a huge drainage area to tons and tons of small practices. If I can't even keep up with inspecting and maintaining, you know, however many large practices I have, how am I, how am I going to inspect all these tiny practices? And so we came up with a, a visual approach, and the idea is that you should be able to do it very rapidly through each practice, as opposed to spending two hours with your long checklist and using a very expensive ending year to get it done. Um, and the key to the visual approach is you really have to understand whoever's doing the inspection, if it's not an engineer, if it's just a trained individual, they have to understand how these practices are supposed to operate. Because I think Tom's introduction was a very good one. So one thing is in your packets, you had a very colorful flow chart. That's what I'm going to be talking about today. And the reason we printed that for you is because um, that's a really awful slide to put up on the screen because there's a lot of text, but um, that's what we're going to talk through. We're also going to talk through, I'm sorry, what did I do? The technical bulletin that we put together that goes through this entire process. What we did is we came up with this visual approach and it can be used as you see in your flow charts at every stage of the inspection process. Um, so at construction inspection, at project acceptance, during routine maintenance, during routine inspections, and then for performance verification, which is required in order to meet the Chesapeake Bay TMDL uh, requirements. So if you're using your practice to get credit towards your Bay TMDL, you're gonna have to verify that it's there every 10 years. Um, so this is a simplified version. Oops, I'm sorry. But anyway, we put this technical memo together and it goes through painful detail each and every one of these visual indicators. We used bioretention as an example, um, but we also did the indicators for other um, commonly used LID practices and those are in the appendix. I'm gonna pass this around but it's my only copy, so I request that we get it back. Um, but take a look as we talk through. Um, and again, you can download it. There's a lot of pictures in it, so it's really expensive if you want to print a fancy copy, but you, the PDF is online and you can download it um, that way. Okay, so the visual indicator approach is the idea of using these simple visual indicators in order to conduct these rapid investigations. 
You do this basically every time you're out at the site, whether it's during routine maintenance, during routine inspections, or during these performance verification inspections. Instead of having this huge 10-page checklist, it's going to result in just a punch list of activities um, that are required in order to bring the BMP up to speed. And then you reserve more severe problems um, for another time, with maybe that's when you bring in your really expensive engineer to spend a couple hours to figure out what's happening in those severe situations. So again, back to the flowchart, where we're going to focus on today is when you're visiting these sites as part of a routine regulatory inspection. Okay, so to evaluate the stormwater BMP, 10 minutes or less? Maybe not, maybe 30 minutes or less. Um, we're going to go through this prescribed sequence where we, we're going to go through the bioretention the same way the runoff runs through the bioretention. So that's at least the way we think about it. It's kind of a logical sequence. We assigned numeric triggers to each of the visual indicators, like if you get um, one inch of erosion or three inches, if that's a more serious problem or a less serious <coughs> problem. But we also recognize that each individual locality has their own kind of threshold for these different visual indicators and you want to revise those numeric triggers and have at it. But basically the idea is, is this, is this practice, do, do we give it a pass, it looks good, does it have some minor issues that could be handled through routine maintenance, some more moderate issues that are a sign of a bigger problem that maybe we might need to, let's say, install pre-treatment before this becomes a major problem, or is it a severe problem and we need to come back and do a major redesign. Um, we developed a tablet-based tool and or smartphone-based tool so you can actually go through the inspection. It, it prompts you, asks you each visual indicator and you can give it, it opens a text box and reminds you what we're looking for and then you can just pick. Is it going to pass a minor, a moderate or severe? And then you can also take a photo and upload it. The final product is a PDF inspection report, which you can then put as part of the project file. Okay. So I don't think that I sent that information, but I'm happy to share that information because you can download that inspection app. It's only right now for bioretention, but it's great, so you can use that. Okay, I need to send all of this. So again, the reason we went to the app is we, we recognize there's this need to integrate um, the inspection process with the technology. So some communities have a, a lot of GIS data, they have big GIS databases, and that's how they keep track of all their different BMPs. Being able to integrate that database with an inspection schedule, a maintenance schedule, to be able to file your reports away. Um, that's what the, the goal is through the smartphone and tablet technology. So, oh, here it is. So that's just talking about. Um, so it'll bring you up. It'll use the GPS on whatever device you're using, you know, your smartphone or whatever. And it'll automatically give you the coordinates. So that's great. You can write in what the name of the facility is. Maybe it has a number. Um, and then this is just an example of what that uh, PDF report is going to look like at the end. So it'll have a little bit of the site information, um, a little bit of the project information, and then, again, you can upload photos and go through each of the individual indicators. So there, you can find it on our website, but I think you guys are gonna follow up with the email afterwards, so I'm happy to write the instructions. It's a little confusing, you have to download it using the web, so I, I wrote all that up, so I will share that. It's open source, so we're kind of hoping somebody will develop it for the other LID practices, even though we already developed the indicators. Okay, so th with that said, I would like to get into the visual indicator approach. And so as you can see here, the idea is it's a triage approach to, in order to limit our, our time on each site. There's the very big flow chart that you have. So those, the only thing I'd like to point out here is those more intense, um, more severe cases trigger what we call a forensic BMP investigation or an FBI. Um, and again, that's when you spend, that's when you're using a more expensive <coughs> engineering time. Okay, so for the routine regulatory inspection, 
The purpose of this is to ensure that the BMP is properly maintained and functioning as designed, and then develop a punch list of tasks that are needed to bring it back up to speed if it's not. It's to fulfill our MS4 permit requirements, and so it happens anywhere between one and five years based on your permit. Um, and our argument is that it can just be a trained person that doesn't have to be an engineer, and the tools that you would use would be these visual indicators that we're going to talk about today. So when you're out in the field, some things you're going to need, you're going to take a lot of photos, measurements, notes. Um, our friends at Stormwater Maintenance and Consulting who inspect and maintain tons of these facilities for a, a number of communities in Maryland and Virginia have come up with a very efficient approach. They have a whiteboard and, um, you know, dry erase markers. And when they go to each facility, in order to take a picture, they have this, they put the site name, they put the date, they take the, the, a little bit of information about what they're taking a picture of. Because as many of you know, you end up back in the office with hundreds of photos of like grass channels and you don't really, what was I, what was I trying to take the picture of? So this is a really good approach. Um, and then you obviously need to use some equipment that you're gonna need when you're inspecting the facility. Um, so we recommend a whiteboard, a manhole pick, um, the digital camera, the smartphone app, if that's the approach you're going to take, and then various tools for opening some of the more structural aspects of bioretention or other practices, a shovel and rake, some measuring tape, plant ID sheet, I think that would be really helpful as we were just talking about, and then some optional items. but. We find that these items are actually make the process a little bit better. Like as builds, I went out to a couple of sites and we couldn't find the practice because it was completely overgrown. Safety vests, I'm a big safety person and bug spray. I think Tom hijacked my slides before I put them up here so he put a six pack of beer, but I'm, that's not what I would recommend. So okay, I'm gonna go through visual indicators but just with the bioretention. We're going to go through it slowly, but ultimately, we hope to be able to do it within 30 minutes or less when we're out in the field. But today, we'll just go through it a little bit more slowly. So, please forgive me. A couple, you're going to see some repeat slides because Tom stole my slides. Um, but I think he did a good job of kind of setting the stage. So, just a reminder by our attention, I'm not going to go through how it works because he went through how it works. It goes by various names in the field but they all operate in the same way, and we saw how they operate, so we'll skip that. But I just wanted to remind you, I think this is really important, that these are the key areas that we need to look at. We may need to take a look at the ponding, we need to look at the filter media as much as possible, we need to look at the pea gravel, if we have a pea gravel layer, the overflow, the vegetation, because there needs to be bio in bioretention. Um, and then the optional layer, optional areas that really depend on the facility itself. If it has an underdrain stone layer, and then if it has an infiltration sump or upturned elbow. So again, we're going to go through the facility the same way runoff goes through the facility. So we're going to come, we're going to take a look at the inlet, go around the side slopes, get down into the bed, look at the vegetation, and then the outlet. So we're just going to go through in this logical manner. Those are the different zones from above in a very basic bioretention schematic. So here are the different indicators that we assigned for bioretention. Uh, we came up with 18 important indicators that you need to look at. And one thing I'll say is I find that these indicators tend to overlap. And so maybe you're checking out the inlet of you know, whether or not it's obstructed, but then you'll find that that has implications to the drainage area and so on and so forth. So these are the visual indicators. Um, you can see we have several in the inlet zone, a couple in the side slopes or perimeter zone, many in the bed. The bed is really important. Um, the vegetation and then the outlet. So again, the forensic BMP investigation is saved for um, a little bit more time to say what's going on with this thing, it's not working, we've got major problems, um, we diagnose why it's not, and how we could possibly fix it, and this is probably going to be done by an engineer. Okay, so our first visual indicator that we're going to look at is the inlet, inlet obstruction. So can water get into our facility? 
Tom showed a number of good photos where water could not get into the facility, and so it looks great, but it's not functioning at all. So what are we looking for here? We're looking for any kind of buildup of sediment or debris outside of the inlet that's preventing runoff from getting in to the facility. So we have pictures of good condition, kind of a minor situation where you've got a lot of pine needles building up there. And that's just a, a question of routine maintenance, making sure that that gets cleaned out before it becomes a big pile that prevents runoff from getting in. It's not cut down all the pine trees. That's not the right solution. Then we have a more moderate situation where we have quite a bit of sediment and debris building up. And then as Tom showed this picture earlier with a huge amount of sediment that's dropped right outside the inlet. So what are some of the problems? You know, what could be causing all of that sediment? Well, maybe there's a source in the contributing drainage area. Maybe our inlet is too small, so the water is standing outside of it. Maybe, um, maybe the facility is receiving more water than it was supposed to when it was originally designed. There's been a change, again, in the contributing drainage area. Um, so that's where we're going to take a little bit more time and investigate what's causing that. A few more pictures of a severe inlet obstruction situation. Um, we've got severe accumulation of sediment and debris, and so we can see that obviously something is wrong with this facility. This, it's preventing the runoff from getting in. Um, it's obviously spending a lot of time outside of the facility instead of going in. So some potential options, we need to locate the source of the sediment and mitigate that. Again, it could be a source of sediment in the contributing drainage area. Um, we might need to add pretreatment or enhance the pretreatment if we already have it and then possibly design remediation to make sure that this doesn't continue to happen. Our next visual indicator that we want to look at in the inlet is any erosion that's happening. Okay, so water is getting into the facility, that's great, um, but we want to see at the inlet if we have any erosion because that can indicate a number of different things. So <coughs> in the top left-hand side of the screen, you can see a pretty good, that, that looks like an inlet that's in pretty good condition. We don't have any real erosion occurring there. Here we've got stormwater runoff coming across the parking lot, sheet flow, it goes into the facility. So it might be a little hard to see, but it's moving the mulch around and it's not a big deal. You could just rake it out and it, it'll be fine. But during, if you let it go, more and more storms are gonna start having these mulch piles which will start channelizing the flow and impacting the facility. Um, this is, a, again, a little bit more moderate of a case, so we need to disperse the flow and investigate why we're having so much erosion at the facility. And here's an example of an FBI situation. There's a huge amount of erosion happening here, and the actual structural components of the bioretention are being <coughs> undermined. And again, so why is this happening? Is it because there's too much water coming in? Is it, is it too small of an inlet that it's kind of channelizing the flow and creating kind of a fire hose effect? And blowing through, but this is obviously going to cause, is causing major issues. So evaluate any inflow protection measures and repair the erosion. Next thing we want to take a look at in our bioretention is pretreatment. Do we have pretreatment? First of all, that's a big one. And then if we have it, um, is it free and clear of sediment and debris? So we have a picture of a pass facility, a pretreatment facility that gets a pass. Then we have one where, okay, so the pretreatment is supposed to capture sediment and debris, so it's functioning as designed. It's doing a good job, but we need to maintain that on a regular basis, otherwise it's gonna fill up and we're gonna have issues. So here is a, an example where we probably don't have pretreatment with this facility and we probably need it. And then again, in a more severe situation, I assume we didn't have any pretreatment in that situation because the facility has failed. There's been so much sediment debris that has come in, it's clogged the filter bed, and we have a major overhaul, which is gonna cost a lot of money and take a long time. So this is our last indicator that we put in the inlet zone that we're gonna take a look at, and this is the structural integrity. And this is not every, that's the other thing that I forgot to mention, is not every indicator is a, goes through these various stages. Some of them are just a pass and fail. So with structural integrity, we have pass and moderate here, but I also think that this could be a fail. Where 
it's like the, the structural components of the bioretention look like they're in pretty good condition here. But in this situation, we've got major erosion happening where the water is coming in. So again, that kind of overlaps with the inlet erosion visual indicator. So we'll have a lot of overlap through this process. But, but without immediate reinforcement, we're going to have a collapse of the parking lot, I guess. And here's another example of a pretty bad structural integrity issue that will require a design repair. All right, so now we're into the perimeter zone of the bioretention. And what we're looking at here is the surface area. So does the surface area match the design of the facility? And if it departs from design, as it often does when we're installing them for various reasons, you know, maybe there was a utility conflict or some other reason, that's okay, that happens, but how much does it depart from the design? Because it was designed to handle a certain amount of water. So if it departs too far from the design, then we're going to have other major issues like more erosion, more sediment buildup, and we just need to be able to compensate for that. So is it a 5% difference from design, a 10% difference from the design, or in more severe cases, like this one, you'll see a greater than 25% uh, difference from the design. And again, that matters because it was originally designed to handle a certain amount of water. It's much smaller, still getting the same amount of water. That's going to require more routine maintenance and probably um, result in some issues. So the next indicator in our, um, in our perimeter zone is side slope erosion. And what we're looking for here is any erosion pretty obvious that's happening, that's occurring on the side slopes. Now, this can happen for a variety of reasons, um, and it also has a variety of implications. <clears throat> if you have erosion of the side slopes, that erosion is going to result in sediment that ultimately ends up on the facility bed, which can end up clogging the facility. So you might have a great facility with great pretreatment and no sediment source in the contributing drainage area, but the actual side slopes are contributing the sediment that ends up clogging your facility. So, again, good condition in the upper left-hand side, and very nice because the side slopes have very good ground cover of turf, there's no mulch there that you have to deal with. Um, water comes in, it's not an issue. Here we have water that comes, kind of runs over the surface, down the slopes, and is causing a, quite a bit of erosion. So again, all that sediment is a source and a potential clog of the, of the biotension bed. Just a little bit of spot receding and making sure um, we can get better vegetative growth there should solve the problem. In more moderate cases, and this is, I think, kind of hard to see, we're starting to form some actual um, rills and gullies because as the water is coming in, whether it's the slope is too steep or whatever, it's causing this erosion um, and preventing the vegetation from growing. Here are some examples of really severe cases. Um, where the question is, could vegetation even grow on those slopes? They're pretty high, and if the water's coming in really fast, it wouldn't allow for that. It may even just need um, application of topsoil to allow vegetation to grow better. Okay, so still in the perimeter zone, we want to take a look at the ponding volume. Tom showed a number of pictures where the water basically came in and went right up. So again, these bioretention facilities, they need to fill up and have some storage. Um, and so that, that's part of how the water gets treated for pollutants and runoff volume. So we can see in the, and you might have already showed that picture, that water comes in and it fills up the entire facility and gets a good ponding volume as designed. In the upper right-hand side, we've got some short circuiting occurring because we've got a little gap and so the water is sneaking out before it's really allowed to pond. And this one, I'm not even really sure anything is happening in this facility. Water seems to come in from the road, go into the inlet, and basically leave. I'm not, I think that might actually be a pretty bad design. And then, so, okay, so here's an interactive slide. So this one, what do you, why do you think that this is severe in terms of ponding volume? What's wrong with this facility? What was 
that? Anyone? Brian, why do you, what's wrong with this facility? Ponding on the pavement. <laughs> it's not really ponding. It's kind of built at above grade from the, where it's supposed to be receiving. So the water is, as you can see from the stains, there's no, it's, there's no depression associated with it. So again, yeah, is it capturing and treating any runoff? No. So the storm water is a rare instance where we like depression. We like, yeah, depression is good in storm water. Doesn't that? Okay. So now we're into the bed zone of the facility. Not out of the side slopes, we got out of the perimeter zone, we're now into the actual bed. And what we're looking for is a nice, relatively level filter bed area. Um, so Tom already showed this picture, but in the upper left-hand side, that's a beautiful facility. It's probably recently installed, but stormwater runs from the parking lot, sheet flow, goes over the pea, gravel, filter into the facility. It looks like it's in great condition. Probably use a little bit more vegetation. Um, in this part where, so we're looking for any sinking of the filter bed. So in this more minor one, when water comes in, we've had a little bit of sinking right where it's coming in. Um, and that could be an issue with the water coming in. It could be that when they first installed the facility, they didn't do, um, any, they didn't soak it with water to prevent any settling. What happens here? This one, this is a moderate case. We've got sinking, like large sinkholes in the bioretention, and they're happening in a linear manner. Does anyone have any ideas of why that would happen? So if it happens in a line like that, it's usually an indication that something is wrong with the underdrain, because that's like the only real linear thing in the facility. And then in this F, and I'll show you in just a second, in this FBI one, this more severe one, you'll see a lot of times sinking at where the structures meet also indicates um, a problem in the connection with those two structures. So a few more pictures of severely sinking filter beds. This is this guy's knee, which is a gigantic sinkhole there. So you need to do a test excavation to find out what the problem is. So here's a good schematic that shows how this could occur. You have your under drain and it has a crack in it. Um, that, that's usually where a sinkhole will form on the bed because you're losing your filter media into your uh, under drain. If you can investigate where the under drain outlets and you see that there's sediment in there, that's also an indication that you've got a problem. The sediment's moving into the under drain. Again, poor connection at where the under drain and the structure meets, that will result in some sinking of the filter bed. And you can, like I said, you can find evidence of it in where it outlets. So some options for investigating why this is happening is a test excavation pit. Um, you're looking at the mulch. You're looking at the soil media, any movement of the soil media, because it should be in those nice layers. You're looking for filter cloth. Um, and then if you can, take a look at the under drain stone and pipe. That's very beneficial as well. So when you're looking in the overflow or the underdrain, you're, what you're looking for, obviously, is sediment. So here's a good example of this, this facility has a major problem. Some, some reason there's sediment getting into the underdrain. It should not happen, um, particularly when you have that pea gravel layer in between the filter bed and the underdrain. Some cool tools to use to investigate the underdrain and other structures. Um, I guess we heard a lot that other organizations, their departments, like their who was it, their sanitary sewer departments, often have a lot of these tools, and so sometimes they'll let them borrow them. But these are just different CCTVs to be able to run up the pipes and see what's happening in there. Because unfortunately, like Tom said in the construction inspection, once the pipes are in the ground, it's really hard to get in there and figure out what's happening. And you'd want to avoid having to dig up the whole facility if possible. Okay, so the next thing we're looking for is any kind of sediment deposition or caking occurring on the facility. So again, if we have sediment coming in, we'll usually see evidence of that at the inlet or in the pre-treatment. Um, but any sediment buildup, ultimately, if we have too much sediment buildup, our facility will end up clogging. We need that filter bed. We need to accept some sediment. That's the whole purpose, to clean the runoff, right? So maybe like the first two inches 
will get some sediment, and that's just a part of routine maintenance. Um, any caking like this, you just rake it, and that will allow better infiltration. More moderate sediment buildup, so I think in the bioretention memo we, we assign maybe three inches or more. Um, you're going to really, again, you're going to have a problem in the future, and you have to figure out where is that sediment coming from in the first place. Is it coming from the drainage area? Is it coming from the side slopes? And so on and so forth. Because ultimately, this is what you will get if you have too much sediment coming into the facility, which is bioretention failure. So determine the sediment depth and its probable source, and, um, either in, within the facility or the contributing drainage area. But you're going to have to completely dig up a lot of that structure. All right, so what else are we looking for in the bed zone of the bioretention is any standing water. So your bioretention should drain completely um, within 48 to 72 hours. So if you have standing water after a storm event, you know, 72 hours after a storm event, it's usually a sign that there's something wrong with the facility. Well, how much standing water? Maybe only some standing water is, is an issue. Here you can see in this minor category, we have saturated solids. So again, we're talking 72 hours after a major storm event. You really shouldn't have those saturated soils. They indicate that water has been standing, either in an isolated area or within the whole facility. So again, it's a sign that something else is going on. In this more in this moderate picture, we have kind of these isolated puddles um, and depressions within the facility where the water has been standing. It's not throughout the entire facility, as in the severe one that we see on the right-hand side of the screen. And does anyone have any guesses as to what caused this one? I think, did you go to this one? Yeah, it was filter fabric that was placed at the bottom of the filter media layer before the underdrain layer. So the water is not actually getting through the other So some options for standing water, you have to do a pump down, you know, if you have, if you're already at this point, you know, this is a major remediation that you need to do. So you've got to do a pump down, you've got to pump down that water, do a test pit excavation to figure out um, where the problem is. Is it, is it sediment that is in the top couple layers so it's not allowing the water to get through? Is it happening in the filter media? Is, it, is there filter fabric separating the two layers? And so on and so forth. Yeah. Or is it a non-perforated underdrain? That you know that could happen as well. So ponding depth. Most of these facilities are designed to a particular ponding depth. Um, we said six to twelve inches because I think that reflects the Virginia design spec. But what is the range of the PA design spec? Can you have up to eighteen inches of ponding in your facilities? Does anyone know? I thought it was up to 18 inches, but I'm not sure. So again, that ponding <clears throat> depth is an important feature in removing pollutants. So if you're not getting full ponding depth, you're not getting full pollutant removal. So a greater than 25% departure from the design assumptions, um, either for the surface area, the storage, or the ponding depth, or the contributing drainage area. Um, so you can see in this photo how and I think Tom showed this a little bit earlier, the inlet is a little bit too low. So when the water comes in, it doesn't fully pond within the facility. It basically comes in and goes out. I'm sorry, the, the yard and the drop in, so it goes out the outlet. So you're not getting that, that pond. And then, I don't know how it is in Pennsylvania, but I know in Virginia, they're very strict on the high end of the ponding depth because they have safety concerns. They won't allow for a a higher ponding depth because they're worried that people will fall in and get hurt. So mulch depth and condition, I think that, so we're still in the bed zone. Um, I think Tom talked a lot about this already, so I kind of, kind of stole my thunder on this one, but it's a good reminder. Um, we don't want to have mulch as much as possible. We have mulch to keep down the weeds, to keep the plants, but ultimately we want to transition to a good ground cover that's going to be better for long-term maintenance costs. Um, so in this upper right-hand picture, you can see a, a moderate, this is the same facility that we showed earlier, 
Um, the stormwater runoff is coming in, it's moving that mulch around, it can just be dealt with by, I mean, there's probably not enough mulch in this situation, and it's being moved around whatever is there. Um, in this, did we show this picture already? In this more moderate picture, which I would argue is a severe situation, the mulch is so deep that the water is actually blocking the inlet. So there's another example where you're looking at the mulch depth conditions, but you're also looking at inlet obstruction. And then one of my favorites is this severe one which again, these are our friends at SMC, they would find a lot of these facilities are maintained by landscape um, companies that don't understand how these facilities are supposed to operate, how they're supposed to function, what the objective is. So they see these gigantic depressions in the parking lot and they fill them up with mulch. So they found in this case, 10 inches of mulch. And so most of the specs, are, it's supposed to have anywhere between two and three inches. So again, that has implications for your ponding volume. You're not getting the same ponding depth that you should be if your whole place is filled with mulch. Actually, we were just in Delaware last week and we saw a buyer attention in front of a uh, restaurant and it was just a gigantic mulch pit. There wasn't any bio in it. <clears throat> So trash, this is um, this may or may not be as applicable in this area. I mean, this is again one of those ones that we're looking for kind of a pass or fail. And so this is a highly urban environment in Baltimore City. So it has a ton of trash, because you're gonna have a lot of trash in the contributing drainage area. That said, it's also supposed to collect that trash and kind of prevent it from getting into our waterways. But it's really important that if you have that much trash in your contributing drainage area, that you're maintaining it on a regular basis to clean that trash out. Otherwise, it can end up blocking some of the more important features, like the inlet, the outlet, and so on and so forth. So now we're looking at any erosion that's happening in the bed. So we want to make sure that the water comes in, it's, it's able to come in through the inlet, it's not, you know, eroding the side slopes, it comes in and it evenly distributes throughout the bed of the facility, it fills up to the appropriate ponding volume, and then is able to filter through. Well, in some of these cases, the water is coming in, but it's coming in a way that's making a preferred flow path, if you will. So you can see in this minor, it just moves that mulch around. Again, we need to break the mulch or maybe evaluate how the water is coming in. In some of these more moderate and severe cases, it's creating that uh, preferential flow path. So it's like a little Grand Canyon going through there. So that has implications for not being able to fully utilize the bed of the bioretention and it's not getting the full pollutant removal. Um, here's a way more severe case. And you really have to look at like, is the water coming in too fast? Is there too much water? Is there um, a design problem with the inlet? And so on and so forth. Or as we've talked about already, have there been significant changes in the contributing drainage area so we're getting more water coming to the facility than it was originally designed for? Oh, wait, do I have time? Oh, I have a lot of time. Um, so vegetation. Tom talked about vegetation a lot already, so I'm not going to spend too much time going over it, but the indicators that we look at when we're using this approach for bioretention at least are the vegetative cover, so how much of the facility has vegetation on it, because again, bio and bioretention is a really important part of it. The vegetative condition, so it's covered in vegetation, but how does that vegetation look? Does it look like it's dead, diseased, or dying? And the, excuse me, vegetative maintenance, how often is it being maintained? Is it, does it need to be maintained on a more regular basis, like that Jerry Garcia picture that Tom showed earlier? So vegetation is a little bit different because it changes over time. So what you originally designed, you know, when you first designed the facility and said this is the vegetation we want to use and this is how we want it to look like. Well, the funny thing about vegetation is it doesn't stay like that, it grows. So do you maintain it to, to keep it as how you originally designed it? Do you, is it okay to allow it to grow up to some degree? At what point is it, um, is it too much and it needs to be trimmed and thinned? So 
So again, this just gets back to, so vegetative maintenance, you really need to understand what is the objective in the original landscaping design. What are you going for? Do you want something a little bit more beautiful? It's good, because it has a lot more eyes on it. If it doesn't have a lot of eyes on it, it's a, a lot easier to maintain something that has mostly turf cover. And we've talked about how expensive mulch can be. So that's a really good, important point. Um, when you do these assessments, when you do these inspections of these facilities, um, it's important to do it either in the spring or the fall, at least as far as being able to inspect the vegetation. It's really hard to inspect vegetation when it's covered with snow or has died back for the winter. So again, what we're looking for here with the vegetative cover indicator is we're looking for whether or not it has a good amount of cover. Our numeric triggers that we assigned is, I've forgotten the one for the minor, but you can see here we've got a few bare spots, so we can just do some spot reseeding, but in these in this picture where we have less than 75% coverage, we're saying, okay, we're not getting the same pollutant removal value because we, we are lacking that vegetation. And then Tom showed the picture on the left already, on the right already, um, but that obviously this is not the right vegetation for these sites. So evaluating the original planting plan and replanting with appropriate vegetation vegetation, engaging the landscape architect um, that you know. Uh, vegetative condition, so again, are, do our plants look good or are they having some major problems? Um, here's some landscaping detective work, you know, why do we have low coverage of vegetation? Why are our plants dead and diseased? I think Tom showed that earlier um, when he showed that there was a facility that had a bunch of dead plants, it's because none of the water was actually getting into the facility. Um, invasive plants are obviously, can be a major problem. So some options, you want to evaluate why the plants fail, because that's going to help you remediate the problem. If it's not getting water, you have a bigger problem on your hands. Um, but then, like I said just recently, who we're from in Howard County, Maryland, they just built a new facility and they put wet, footed dogwoods. Is that right? Did I get that right? What put a dogwood trees? But they put them really high on the slopes of the facility where they're not going to get any water. So they're not going to do well there. And then develop a new planting plan with the appropriate vegetation that meets, you know, whatever is causing the problem in the first place. So as far as invasive plants goes, designing and implementing um, an eradication plan and then evaluating the remaining plants so that you can, you know, make sure that it works. And then, okay, so vegetative maintenance. Why does it matter? So again, we want to maintain the right amount of vegetation, but we don't want to have too much vegetation. So some of these situations, you've got either you can lose your facility. In this particular case, we have a lot of trees. Well, ultimately, trees will end up taking a lot of that storage volume away um, if you have too many. So this was, was not planted this way originally. This is where it was <coughs> 10 years later. Um, Tom already showed the one in Seattle. And then this one, it's like, is there a, a bioretention in this picture? And then finally, so um, we were in the vegetation zone. I'm sorry, I forgot to tell that. And then finally, our last indicator for bioretention is the underdrain. We want to make sure, and again, we've already hopefully um, we kind of overlapped this earlier when we were looking for any bed sinking. But you know, just because we didn't see bed sinking doesn't mean that there isn't a problem happening with the underdrain. So what we want is underdrain shouldn't have any sediment in it. It should look pretty free and clear of any sediment or debris. Um, and then any major sediment in the underdrain is an indication that there's something else happening in the bioretention. So again, you gotta go back to looking for your bed sinking and doing a test of it to find out. And here's another one of those kind of pass or fail situations. So some resources that help, I think, with this visual approach. You saw the technical memo that just went around. I told you about the inspection app, which I'm happy to share instructions with you. We've done a couple of webcasts.
And I don't think I mentioned earlier, all of our webcasts are recorded and then put onto our website. So if you can't actually make one um, live, you can listen to it after the fact. We actually just did one with Pennsylvania DEB. Did you attend? Did somebody from this group attend? There was someone from Altoona who attended. Um, and it was all about creating your Chesapeake Bay pollution reduction plans. And so that's on our web website now. Uh, we did, a few years ago, we did several videos on installation of these practices, installation, maintenance, and inspection. And installation and maintenance are both in English and Spanish. So does anyone, before I go on, I think I have a few more slides on some of the visual indicators of this other low impact development practices. Does anybody have any questions or comments on the visual inspection approach? Yeah. What is the name of the app? Bioretention Illustrated. It's, um, so it's on this thing called Fulcrum. That's what we use. <coughs> so you have to download Fulcrum. You can download that to your tablet or your smartphone. But in order to link to the actual app, you have to put that on your account. So you make your account on the web. That makes sense, like on your computer, and you link to it, and then it'll show up here. Like this is the app. These are the apps that are associated with this account. And right now, once you sign up, you it's a free 30-day trial. Unfortunately, it used to be free entirely, and they switched to this. But at least you can practice and see what you think. Oh, I guess that's the end. Well, um, even if I don't have more slides, and again, in the appendix and the appendices for this, we have, hopefully you guys took a look, we did visual indicators for grass channels, filter strips, permeable pavement, and infiltration. Um, in the next year or two, we hope to do visual indicators for a number of other restoration practices that people use on a regular basis. Is that report available on your website? It is. Mm -hmm. And it's actually one of the resources that I asked the Alliance to put on the website. So all of our PowerPoint slides will be available to you. Somebody asked me that earlier. All of our PowerPoint slides will be available to you after the workshop. Um, I don't think that they had time to put them on the website. But I don't know. Drew, do you know if any of the PowerPoints or the web resources have been uploaded yet? Uh, they haven't been uploaded yet. Tonight. Okay. So tonight, so Bioretention Illustrated will be up there. Um, I can also send, I can probably send the instructions to you tonight as well that you can put up there for the app if you wanted to try it out. Um, what else? Anything else? The web, the web videos, we have them, we have hard copies, but they're also on YouTube, the construction inspection. Okay, well, we're way early. It's 